Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Tyler Sticka. I'm a designer here in Portland. I make uh, websites and apps, and occasionally I get to make games. And so that's why I'm really excited today to talk about video games, and specifically the best video game console you probably never owned. Now, how many people here uh, sh do the Sega shout if you're familiar with Sega and the Genesis? Right, I was hoping for a SEGA, but I didn't, didn't get any of that. That's okay. Participa <laughs> participation ribbons for everyone. Uh, they made the Genesis. They also made the Saturn less successfully, but that's not the console I want to talk about. The console I want to talk about is the last one they made, which was the Dreamcast. Released on 9999, my brother and I got one for Christmas, and we were so excited. Uh, but turns out we were weirdos, because when you look at sales statistics for every 15 people that bought a PlayStation 2, only one of us had a Dreamcast. So we were the odd man out in a lot of ways. Um, but we didn't know that at the time. We just thought this thing is awesome. It came out with a great lineup of games. It was the first 128-bit console back when it was the last system where bits mattered. And uh, for us, this was the future of gaming. And But it turns out, as things have moved along, it actually kind of was. It sort of told the future. I mean, it had better graphics processing capabilities, so you could do more stylized stuff, stuff that would become overused in the next few consoles, like cool 3D graphics. But it could also handle bigger worlds and bigger ideas, which meant that years before games like Grand Theft Auto 3 popularized this idea idea of open, expansive worlds. Games like Shenmue were doing it, you know, frankly, with a little bit more subtlety uh, on the Dreamcast. Uh, and there were other components of the hardware that made it special. It was the first console to ship with a modem built in. It had a web browser and everything. And that meant that for folks who were experiencing first-person shooters like Halo for the first time, um, it just kind of felt like an echo of stuff that had been on the Dreamcast for at least a couple of years. And it wasn't just shooters and simple multiplayer online games. There were massively multiplayer uh, online experiences, which were really fun as well. And again, were previously just exclusive to PCs. And there were also more like mainstream hardware advancements that took the world by storm later. Uh, for example, you know, you all probably remember the Wii and Wii Sports and, and swinging the remote for tennis. Well, you could actually do that on the Dreamcast like six years earlier. Uh, there was more motion sensitive controllers that enabled things like fishing games, tennis games, even a maraca shaking game that would come to the Wii later called Samba de Amigo. There was even a microphone attachment allowing you to vocally control the unfortunately named Seaman. Uh, <laughs> voiced by, this is true, the late Leonard Nimoy did his voice. Uh, and. Uh, uh, years before the Kinect, and even today, the most uh, well-reviewed game for the PlayStation VR is just a remaster of a game that came out on Dreamcast in 2001. That's all it is. And it's going to continue because I look at what the Nintendo Switch has promised to do next year, and similar to the Wii U, it's sort of this idea of bringing portable gaming to home gaming and connecting the two. And that was an idea the Dreamcast introduced with their memory cards, which had a screen, had a controller. You could download games from the internet from other games, pick them up, take them with you, play them independently. Um, in some ways, they anticipated mobile gaming because they even were planning an add-on. But they didn't get to make it. They didn't get to make a lot of things. Because the Dreamcast died after 18 months. One year and a half is all it lasted before they ceased production. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, Sega was in a bad financial place. Um, there are marketing reasons. PlayStation 2 is really well marketed. But the main reason was our relationships with gadgets were changing. Uh, was changing. Uh, the the PlayStation 2 was designed to play DVDs. It wasn't just a game system. In fact, when it came out, it was a pretty lousy game system. A terrible lineup, hard to program for. But to play DVDs, it looked good in your media cabinet. And that's a trend that continues to this day. When we look at the devices that are popular, you know, photographers have said for years, the best camera is the one you have with you. But that applies to everything, not just cameras. So we're consolidating devices, not doing end-to-end -end experiences as much, but making it all happen in software. And in a lot of ways, that's good, but it also also means that some people who design experiences best when the software and hardware work together have failed to follow along. Not everyone has the cash reserves of a Nintendo or an Apple, and they struggle. All this to say that the next time you are in a thrift store or a garage sale or a Goodwill, and you see this weird little dusty gray console sitting there for a fraction of its retail price, now you've seen this talk, I want you to stop. Um, give a moment of silence for Sega's uh, weird, innovative, future-telling canary in the coal mine. Thank you very much.